the fields of architecture and urban planning are poised to undergo dramatic changes. At the end of the 20th century, we saw the emergence of the star architect as a cultural force and the consolidation of architecture as an agent for physical change in cities across the world. The 2008 Olympics in China were the culmination of this era and a demonstration of the potential, of the potential power of architecture. However, this model of practice has already shown its limits its weaknesses and its flaws. In 2008, at the same time that architecture made its tour de force in Beijing, the unemployment rate for architects more than double from the previous year. In the new economy, architecture was hit badly. It is safe to say that a new generation of practitioners will not be able to follow in the footsteps of its predecessors, and more importantly, should not. Technological changes paired with economic forces are significantly altering the constructions of buildings and the practice of architecture. Conventional techniques will no longer suffice if architecture is to remain a viable venture. In addition, architecture's role in the construction of culture has become to be associated with the least societies and as a result has remained outside of recent dramatic cultural shifts. It is evident that architecture is being left out of most critical issues in the national agenda, despite the fact that historically our field has precisely demonst demonstrated that it has the tools and the expertise to address this, precisely these very pressing problems. Housing, environment, infrastructure, just to name a few. We must wonder if our concern for very narrow problems, mostly formal, has led to our failure to engage the world. The time has come to re-examine these issues and to begin to chart a new course for the future of our disciplines. This will require new approaches to cultural engagement and for architecture and planning to rewrite their own history. These changes need to begin at home with our own cultural institutions, namely in architecture and planning schools. At critical points in the history of our fields, the Academy has given us critical perspectives with which to measure and evaluate our impact upon the world. Academia provides a lens independent of the demands of practice and the demands of the profession that has the potential to advance the fields in extraordinary ways. But so far, pedagogy is not living to its potential. Our teaching methodologies and the predominant model of the studio instruction has remained virtually unchanged for 100 years. Most importantly, in the last 20 years, I would argue that architecture has stagnated in pursuing research that narrowly focuses on topics which prove to have very little consequence. The conundrum of academic specialization is not exclusive to our disciplines. Our current environmental, economic, and societal crises have exposed the limits of conventional notions of, of specialization as a mode of research and scholarship in every field. Many disciplines are beginning to recognize this and are moving towards an interdisciplinary model of research and education. In no area does this become more pertinent than in the environmental arena. In the first decade of the 21st century, it has become clear that during the 20th century, by looking at technological advances in isolation, we missed their broader impact. Efficient production methods have led to the proliferation of goods, and it's now clear that our consumption patterns have led to a disastrous impact on the globe. This is certainly true for architecture and planning as well. In the last century, we exalted the benefits of new materials and methods of construction in terms of efficiency and financial economy, but we overlooked their impact on natural resources. For most of the 20th century, we exalted the comfort and convenience of the suburbs while overlooking their impact on a larger network of ecosystems. Now we know that addressing environmental degradation has no easy answer and that the responsibility resides across many fields. 
transgressing the boundaries of various disciplines may be the only way to address the complex challenges of our time. Because of their history and their nature, architecture and planning are best suited to develop an academic model that works across disciplines. After all, unlike most other fields, architecture is an intricate area of study that encompasses distinct fields in the sciences and in the humanities. And on the other hand, urban planning is actually considered the first most multidisciplinary profession. It is not surprising that several schools of architecture and planning actually mention interdisciplinarity as part of their mission. However, in most cases, this is limited to the relationship between architecture and landscape architecture, architecture and urban planning, or architecture and interior design. I would argue that instead, the disciplines of architecture and urban planning should re-examine their place within a larger body of knowledge that lead to new pedagogies. Only through new teaching methods that work across disciplines will we be able to allow future generations to look at design holistically, writing a new chapter in the public mission of architecture and planning. Now, to illustrate these points, I have included an example from my own design practice. I do not mean to imply that we are the only ones exploring these issues. There are plenty of practitioners and academics researching similar techniques. I use an example from my own practice to put my money where my mouth is, so to speak. Located in a 1920s former banking hall in Providence, Rhode Island, the design of the New Rhode Island School of Design main library posed numerous challenges and opportunities that were addressed through engagement with new design and fabrication techniques. And I think that this will be an example of how new interdisciplinary thinking can open new avenues for design. The project had a very low budget, a compressed com construction schedule, a limited site access, in addition to the sensitivity of intervening in a space in the National Register of Historic Places. Our strategy was simple, to build new structures in the banking hall that would accommodate the functions that the existing space did not have the ability to absorb, such as circulation services, study carrels, group study, computer stations, and other technology. While contemporary in character, these new structures were designed to keep good company with the existing space and complement it. Their size was carefully studied to be architectural, but not to overwhelm the banking hall. These pavilions were conceived as larger than furniture, but not monumental in scale. In this project, digital technology allowed us to explore in depth the possibility that mass customization might enable the application of principles of universal design at a public scale. Universal design argues that we should not think of people as being in two categories, able and disabled. But instead, we should, think, we should think of design for people with various ranges of abilities. It's a critique of the conventional approach of architecture of using average and architectural standards. To that end, instead of designing for the average person, at RISTI, all components of the study areas, tables, seats, shelves, are dimensionally different, heights, widths, depths, allowing us to accommodate people of all sizes and abilities, as well as providing flexibility in occupation. At RISTI, we were able to maximize types of reading spaces and offer many possibilities for individuals as well as group study. Designing for a range of bodies, designing for the many as opposed to the few. While we did this very didactically and a bit, quite frankly, tongue-in-cheek in the circulation island here in your screen, we were, we were um, in this case, we were deploying the height for a standing male at one end and the dimension of a seated female at the other end and then everything in between. In the study pavilion, the variation was more subtle. The idea was to give different body sizes the ability to occupy space differently. 
For example, some cubicles are wider and more spacious than others, and therefore they will be more likely to be shared in joint projects. Others are a bit more intimate and potentially more likely for people to go hide into. Given that this is a public space, and students at risk they are there for four or five years, we anticipated that over time students will find their favorite spot, the place in which they're truly comfortable, even though they might not actually not understand why. These variations are today technically possible and affordable because the digitally guided router does not care what shape is cutting. Instead, repetition in assembly, that component of building that is done by hand, was the key to the affordability of the project. The two largest elements of the intervention, the pavilions, were broken into pre-assembled modules that were bolted together on site. We explored an alternative delivery model whereby conventional shop drawings were eliminated. The pavilions were designed in three dimensions. Each component was then taken from the 3D model, labeled for ease of assembly, and organized into 2D files that the fabricator could use for production. These flattened components were nested in the most materially efficient manner. The fabricator then reviewed our 3D and 2D files, looking for conflicts and discrepancies, thereby retaining the liability. The files were actually used directly for fabrication, thereby eliminating the distance between the designer and the means of production. In turn, the millwork package was drawn as a guide for assembly. This balance between off-site fabrication and if ease of site assembly allowed the project to be delivered in time and within a low budget. In turn, the method of assembly enables the, po the project's possible future disassembly, a strategy that anticipates that the use of the banking hall might in fact change once again. Digital technology not only allowed us to use materials in a very economical way, but also that the materials and the space might actually be reused and changed in the future. Mass customization also allowed us to incorporate the RISD community directly into the project. While the perforation of the surfaces of the pavilions was an, an aesthetic choice to make their volumes seem lighter, Digital technology allowed us to translate those perforations into an alphabet that could then be combined into a language. The budget allowed for 32,000 characters of any type, and since, again, the machine does not care what shape is cutting, the librarians developed a list of writers and artists that included graduates from RISTI and faculty from RISTI as well. I use this small example to demonstrate how architecture lies at the intersection of various disciplines. We incorporated techniques from industrial design and engineering, public, he public health, social science, environmental technology, and material science. Architecture and urban planning are at the center of some of the most complex problems of our time, regardless of the size of the project. It is only by engaging with disciplines outside of our own that we will be able to truly ful fulfill our remarkable potential for change. Conventionally, architects are planner and planners have been charged with bringing beauty to the environment. This is a powerful charge. We will only be effective if we bring our ability to produce beauty to a broader audience and in the con context of significant cultural concerns, one project at a time. Thank you.